We're starting this one with a quiz. Don't worry, there isn't a wrong answer. Just give your honest, gut-level feeling. Ready? Is this art? Remember your answer. It'll be important later. Liberals and conservatives. This isn't the best terminology, but for the purpose of this video, I'll use liberal to refer to anyone left of center and conservative to refer to anyone to the right of center. I know this will annoy some of you, but I need a term that's a little less awkward than people left of center. I realize there are significant differences of opinion within each side, but that isn't what I'll be dealing with in this video. Having said that, what are liberals and conservatives? Why do liberals support abortion rights, while conservatives champion gun rights? And why aren't there more people that believe in both increased border security and environmentalism? Or oppose both LGBT rights and increased oil drilling? These groupings are fairly consistent across different countries and cultures. We can even see the dichotomy in ancient Rome, which saw the populaires who supported expanding citizenship, and their rivals, the optimates, who instead wanted to strengthen existing hierarchies. Clearly there is some set of principles behind liberalism and conservatism that are both significant enough to define the politics of a wide variety of places and stable enough to stand the test of time. But pinning down these principles isn't as easy as it might seem. For example, conservatives often champion the ideas of freedom and limited government, but historically they tend to favor strong militaries and police forces while opposing sexual freedoms and drug legalization. Meanwhile, liberalism is often associated with the interest of minorities and the poor, but these groups are generally more religious and less supportive of immigration and LGBT rights, which is generally not reflected in liberal politics. Or, we might define conservative and liberal principles according to the tension between tradition and progress. But even though concepts like the melting pot and the separation of church and state are very much a part of the American tradition, they seem more aligned with liberal ideas. And even though expanding free speech online would appear to be progressive, it's conservatives that tend to support it. Another popular framing claims that liberals support government intervention on economic issues but not social issues, and conservatives want intervention on social issues but not economic ones. But there are plenty of social issues where liberals support government actions such as gun control, funding for the arts, regulation of hate speech, and proactive anti-racism, while conservatives more often support government intervention on economic issues in the form of subsidies for U.S. businesses and protection of jobs in danger of being offshored. Furthermore, the differences between conservatives and liberals don't stop at policy positions. Why are 85% of opera singers liberal, while 69% of truck drivers conservative? It seems unlikely that singing in Italian is causing people to support BLM, or vice versa. Whatever underlying principle defines liberalism and conservatism also needs to explain these divisions. This brings us back to the question you answered at the beginning of this video. In 2019, researchers posed the same question to 1,100 people and found the answers they gave strongly predicted whether they had favorable opinions about Donald Trump. Opinions about this colored pencil drawing were more predictive of support for Trump than your gender whether you have a college degree, whether you live in a red or blue state, whether you're older or younger than 50, whether you live in a suburb, or whether you're in the military. Once again, I don't think your opinion on gun control impacts your interpretation of this piece. This is just another example which shows that liberalism and conservatism are more than just political ideas. So what actually defines these philosophies? To answer that, I'll use two thought experiments, one for each side, starting with conservatives. Imagine you're in a zombie apocalypse, a bad one. Billions have died and risen in on death. Every government and institution has fallen. 
Small bands of survivors scrape and scavenge for survival, struggling against not only the living dead, but also other such groups that would rob, enslave, or murder them. As a survivor in one of these groups, what do you value? Safety, obviously. You'll want guns, of course, along with strong, capable allies. Everyone in your group must pull their weight. Stragglers and freeloaders don't deserve the protection of the community. You'll have the utmost respect for those that fight and die to keep you safe. Order, hierarchy, and conformity will be critical. There's a reason military forces around the globe value these principles. When you're in a life-and-death situation, you want clear roles and strong leadership. You'll be very suspicious of outsiders, and for good reason. You can't risk someone stealing your food, undermining your group, or stabbing you in the back. And, to be honest, if the dead are rising, a lot of people would likely turn to religion. On the other hand, you probably won't be too concerned about things like the environment, the well-being of other groups, learning about or working on things unrelated to zombie survival, the ethics of killing zombies, long-term problems like climate change, and whether everything in society is fair. In other words, you would be pro-gun, pro-religion, very supportive of the military and law enforcement, against welfare, against environmentalism, against college, and your foreign policy would be analogous to America first. When you imagine yourself in a zombie apocalypse, you find the world more threatening, and this shifts all of your priorities. The principle behind conservatism is the feeling that the world is generally a dangerous place, and our priority should be survival. Now instead, imagine that when the zombie apocalypse hit, you escaped aboard a spaceship along with a select community of people. These people are all honest, trustworthy, and upstanding friends who know and get along with each other. Furthermore, the advanced technology of the spaceship provides perfect security and covers all of your needs – food, shelter, medical care, etc. You land on an idyllic planet, inhabited by a small population of primitive but peaceful aliens that welcome your coming. In this situation, how do your views change? With your basic needs met, you're free to turn your attention to other priorities – art and beauty, expanding the frontiers of knowledge, preserving nature, and creating a free and fair society. It wouldn't really matter if everyone was contributing or conforming. If natives come to you for help, you'll likely provide it. After all, you have practically unlimited food and supplies. On the other hand, imagine if your security officer, who has had little to do other than getting pets out of trees, suddenly started demanding lots of powerful weapons and the ability to override the ship's security to deal with emergencies. You would rightly be pretty suspicious. In other words, you would be opposed to strengthening the military and law enforcement, supportive of welfare, college, art, and environmentalism, and your foreign policy would be generous towards outsiders. When you imagine yourself in a perfectly safe world, you feel secure, which shifts your priorities in the opposite direction of the zombie example. If conservatives tend to believe the world is generally dangerous and our priority should be survival, Liberals tend to believe the world is generally safe, and we can afford to focus on thriving. This divide, along with its downstream effects, explain the differences between liberals and conservatives across multiple dimensions. Political positions such as universal health care, welfare programs, and permissive immigration are deeply tied to ideas of scarcity and abundance. When you feel threatened, you naturally want to protect your resources, they could be important to your survival. Therefore, you're less likely to support programs that spread wealth around and benefit outside groups. Positions on LGBT rights, abortion rights, and religion are related to conformity and tradition. When you feel safe, you're more willing to experiment and try new things, and feel less pressured to participate in the kinds of rigid social structures that are useful when facing threats. Therefore, you're more willing to reject the traditions and hierarchies of the past. Earlier, we asked why 85% of opera singers are liberal. 
There is the obvious point that opera singing is not a practical skill for survival, but also consider that liberals tend to seek out novelty significantly more than conservatives. If the world is a threatening place, new experiences are likely to be bad, but if the world is a safe place, you can afford to explore. This means that artistic fields are dominated by liberals, from 82% of novelists to 92% of directors. Then consider why 69% of truck drivers are conservative, while 64% of flight attendants are liberal. Both of these professions travel from place to place every day, but driving is a very practical skill, while coaxing passengers to properly store their baggage isn't. Furthermore, the flight attendant is likely to travel internationally and interact with many people outside of their in-group, while the trucker is not. To return to the quiz you took, I'm sure by now you've deduced that those who said this is art were less likely to support Trump. As I explained earlier, liberals are more interested in novelty, which means they're more likely to enjoy unusual art. Additionally, the fact that conservatives value tradition more than liberals means that they'll be less willing to explore art that breaks from ideas such as representationalism and conventional ideas of beauty. Multiple studies also back up this model, with findings that show that conservatives have stronger reactions to threatening and disgusting images. But even more impressively, scientists were able to predict political affiliation with 83% accuracy solely based on variations in brain structure. Specifically, conservatives had proportionately larger right amygdalas, a region of the brain associated with processing negative emotions such as disgust, anxiety, and fear. While we can't test whether conservatives actually perceive the world as more threatening, these results do lend credence to that theory. I think the natural inclination upon learning this is to think, well, my side is clearly superior. Liberals will label conservatives as too frightened and close-minded to engage with the world thoughtfully. Conservatives will tar liberals as naive and oblivious to the very real threats we face. The reality is, there is no correct way to interpret how dangerous the world is. Both approaches have strengths and weaknesses that we should be aware of. The conservative mindset emphasizes the kinds of practical skills that keep the world working, as well as the accumulated wisdom of our forebearers. It also ensures we are ready in the case of an emergency, and gives us the resolve and organization to respond to threats. But it can also lead to irrational mistrust and bigotry, and miss ways we can make things better. The liberal mindset brings us art, entertainment, and technology. It fosters exploration and a never-ending ambition to improve society. But it also can be too quick to discard the lessons of the past, and the lack of a unifying force can lead to atomization and infighting. When there's no perceived threat, humans tend to turn towards status-seeking games and virtue signaling. The world is likely a better place for having both conservatives and liberals, but polarization is tearing this country apart. Hopefully by understanding each other, we can heal some of the rifts in our society. If you'd like to see my video on why liberals and conservatives have a difficult time communicating, there's a link on the screen now. This video is largely based on the essay, A Survive Slash Thrive Theory of the Political Spectrum, by Scott Alexander, on his blog, Slate Star Codex. There's a link in the description below. If you enjoyed this video, my only request is that you spend two minutes thinking about the things you appreciate about your friends and family, or instead you can like, comment, or subscribe. Thank you for watching.